Dropless cataract surgery is something that I've experimented with over the last now five years. And I think you've seen some of these patients in clinic. Yes, several of them. It's a very exciting option for patients to not have to be on any drops after cataract surgery. The actual steroid medication can be injected under the conjunctiva. And in most of the cases, the antibiotic is uh, injected intracamerally in the anterior chamber. And different versions of dropless, I guess the best term would be less drops, very commonly used one combines the antibiotic and steroid and is injected into the vitreous, which I don't like for reasons that we'll see a little bit later. I tend to separate them. The antibiotic goes into the anterior, front, anterior chamber, which is the way it's done in Europe. And that's uh, the uh, study that showed that it decreases endophthalmitis. That's the way it was done. I use moxifloxacin and then the steroid, which in this case is uh, trimcinolone, is injected subconjunctivally. Sometimes not only the steroid is injected, but also some air, which you can see here, that gets absorbed normally by the body within a few days. Yeah, I'm much more accustomed to seeing it with seeing it look like a more white deposit beneath the conjunctiva, which is why at one one day post op, I was surprised by that air there. And that was a good lesson for me to learn. We can see additional examples of this. This was a patient whose wife said, Oh, yeah, what's this in my husband's left eye? He just had cataract surgery. And sure enough, you can see that white deposit down there at the bottom. And this can be rather unusual looking because it's obviously not a natural occurrence. It's a medication that was placed there. Patients have described it as pus. They've described it as a pimple. I try to hide this from the patient down here now, inferior nasally, tends to be probably the safest spot because there's also less muscles in this area and probably less likely to be seen. But most patients will pick it up at some point, usually in a woman if they put on makeup or if somebody else looks at the eye just to see if there's anything going on. And interestingly, sometimes it can actually migrate up just a little bit. This patient noticed the white spot at the inside corner of the eye, and that one was not injected in that location. It actually migrated upwards just a little bit. And that would be an indication that even though I say it's a subconjunctival subtenone injection, this clearly is subconj, which a good refresher of anatomy, conjunctiva inserts at the limbus, tenons inserts a few millimeters back, so tenons injection can thus not migrate to this location. Mm, good example. Uh, also, just this little bump right here is a conjunctival cyst that we see in a lot of patients' eyes. Now, most of the time, this goes without any complication. This is what it actually looks like under the operating microscope with the injection of that medicine under the conjunctiva. A very quick procedure right at the end of the case. And some patients, it's not uncommon at day one or even by the first week to see some residual uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage. What was unusual about this case is the patient was perfectly fine for about four months and started to notice recurrent subconjunctival hemorrhages right in the area of that injection. And we see this in patients who use chronic steroids. Somebody who is on steroids for a graft, for example, will also tend to have a higher incidence of subconjunctival hemorrhage. Any steroid makes the Vessel is a little bit more fragile, thus they are more likely to rupture and burst, creating a not emergent, not concerning, not light, sight threatening complication, but it is concerning to the patient if the eyes keeps getting red. Now, nothing is perfect, so I'm not going to say that the subconjunctival injections have no complications. I already mentioned some of the drops. This is one that is unique to an injection, although again, you can get the same with use of topical steroid drops. However, the injections tend to stay around for months, up to six months. And obviously that's the concern of a steroid response as well. Yeah, and this patient elected to have it removed. So this is a short two minutes of the removal, starting with lidocaine injection for numbing just under the conjunctiva, right in the area where that catalog is going to be removed. And the reason for the extraocular application versus intraocular of steroids is exactly this. I can remove it should there be an issue. Besides having the subconjunctival hemorrhage, the patient was a mild steroid responder, if I remember correctly. Her pressure in this eye was at 20, the other was at 14. So after this was three months after surgery, we said, you know, let's just remove the little plaque and get the patient back to her life so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And as far as peak, interesting enough, three months it would be the peak pressure uh, incident. So if you have somebody like this, you're concerned, if you check them at three months, usually afterwards the pressure comes back down because the steroid obviously will be absorbed in the long run. And you mentioned at the start that sometimes steroid is injected intravitreally, which if that was a steroid responder, that's a much more challenging proposition to now get that steroid out and that patient would continue to have a steroid response. Whereas subconjunctival, it's removed as you can see in this video.
And again, this can be done in the clinic. This was not in any surgical suite or even in the operative. This was done right at the sit lamp. The steroid tends to get absorbed or tends to coagulate, if you will, in tenons. Tenons is almost like a sponge. So as the steroid gets pushed through, it filters it like a sieve would, and the particles get stuck in this little plaque that can be removed in one piece, usually by peeling it out bluntly. I was wondering about that because when I watch this, it looks very adherent and sticky, almost like pulling some gum off the bottom of your shoe and taking some scissors to actually cut that free. And it took a little bit of work, but would you say this was a fairly typical removal for the other catalogs that you've removed? Yeah, this was really good. I've recently changed. Previously, I tried to cut everything out, but as you can tell here, I do a lot more blunt dissection because there's less injury to the conjunctiva. And being that it's in the inferior fornix, as you can see here, the conjunctiva reapproximates fairly quickly. I put them on topical antibiotic steroids for maybe a couple of weeks, and then that conjunctiva should close very smoothly and without any observable scarring or issues.